Um, the, a couple other things, just before I move into the message tonight, um, just again want to remind you, uh, this is really exciting. This is the first week. This is week one of the story. And uh, again, just a couple of things I want to highlight to you. A in behind the Journey Kids sign up, there, on the top shelf there, we still have some invitations to the story. And we encourage you uh, to take some if you want to invite somebody to the story here at the Journey Church. We still have some prayer cards uh, that you can be part of. We started the 40 days of prayer about 20 days ago, so still about 20 days to go. And we'd love to have you praying for the story. So take one of those if you don't have one. Um, as well, we're really excited about our journey groups. We have now um, officially 20 adult groups um, already, all ready to go. We have still about another five to seven that we're still working out some confirmation things. And, and, and we're using September as a bit of a rolling start. So we're, not, we're still really excited about even those other ones possibly coming on board. But the thing is, if you're interested in being part of a journey group, and the way we want to really treat the journey through this story is this way. We want you to consider coming to the weekend preach as the appetizer. That's a good appetizer. It's a solid appetizer, but it's an appetizer. Reading the story itself, so reading the chapter for the week um, is the main course. Okay, that's the main course. And just, oh, and by the way, when I preach every week, I'm going to be assuming you've read the chapter. Okay? So you've got to have it read before. So it's like eating the main course before you come for the appetizer. I know it's kind of mixed up. But then the dessert is the small group experience where you move from a row to a circle. But not a circle here, but a circle somewhere else. And uh, we're excited about the, that. Now, if you're saying, I don't know anyone, I don't know any group I could go to. Go to the kiosk, and when you pick up your book in your small group curriculum material, um, they have a, a, a sign-up there where you can just leave your name, your email address, and your phone number, and we will let you know of some possibilities. We'll, we'll say, Here, here's one or two groups that probably is a good fit for you. Okay, So don't, don't miss out on that dessert part of, of the story. It's going to be really exciting. Now, with all that said... Oh, my goodness, I can't think of anything else. Uh, I think I've covered all my preamble. So um, as, um, as for us to get our heads into the first uh, chapter of the story and the first part of what the Bible tells us, let's watch this. In the beginning, the earth was a dark, empty blob. God spoke and created the entire world. Light, sky, fish, birds, and animals. Then God said, let us make human beings in our own image, and created man out of dirt. And the man became a human being, named Adam. After six days of work, God took a rest. God then put Adam in a garden where there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from it, you will die. Eventually, God caused the man to fall asleep, took out one of his ribs, and created a woman who Adam named Eve. God joined Adam and Eve together in marriage. Later, a serpent came and convinced Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying they would become like God if they did. Eve took a bite, and then so did Adam. Because of this choice, God cursed the serpent as well as Adam and Eve and forced them out of the garden, away from the tree of life. Outside the garden, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. When they made sacrifices, God accepted Abel's sacrifices of animals, but not Cain's sacrifice of crops. This made Cain so angry that he murdered Abel. People began to populate the entire earth, and wickedness and tragedy continued to spread. God was sad and regretted ever making human beings, and decided to wipe them from the face of the earth. God found one man, Noah, who walked faithfully. So God instructed Noah to build a giant boat called an ark and to take his entire family along with a male and female of every kind of animal onto the boat. 
For 40 days it rained and the entire earth was flooded, wiping out every living thing, plants, animals, and humans, all of it destroyed. Eventually, the flood stopped and the ark came to rest on dry land. Noah and his family came out of the ark and God made a promise that the entire earth would never again be completely flooded. God put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of this promise, and God looked for someone who God could use to bless the entire world. Well, that's a great summary of chapter one of the story, and also a great summary of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, again, just want to say hello to all those who are watching this uh, via our YouTube channel and especially to Ty and Amanda up in Labrador City who are doing a house church for the Journey Church up there. And uh, we want to pray your blessing on you guys as you continue your journey with us. Now, as you um, are um, starting with us tonight, and I always think about this. Do you have a, ever have a friend who, who you say, let's go to a movie and they show up late to the movie. I mean, you got in there early, got your popcorn, you know, got your pop, you know, everything. Watched all the pre-movie clips and everything. Watched the new movie clips. And then you let the movie start it. And then your friend, like, shows up 15 minutes late because, you know, they were doing something. And then they start whispering to you all the way through the movie, like, well, well who's this? And, and why is that going on? Or, or maybe you, you're, you know, you start watching a television sh- series and they come in on, you know, episode eight, you know, and you've watched the first seven and uh, they keep going, well, who's that? And why are they doing that? And why is she acting like that? And why is he, what, go, what's going on? And of course, you know, you may have a friend like that. My wife has a friend like that. Her name is Dave Morehouse. And, um, <laughs> and, and I mean, What drives you crazy, right, is you just simply want to say, if you really want to understand what's going on, you've got to start at the beginning, you know. Uh, Julie Andrews sang a song like that one time. A very good place to start is right at the beginning. You know, starting at the beginning sets up the whole framework. And when we come to the Bible or to the story that you're reading, um, we're coming at the very beginning. It, It helps us put a whole framework to everything else about God's story and our story. In the beginning, we read in the very first verse of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Have have you ever considered the creative power of God? Um, In 1996, astronomers focused a powerful Hubble Space Telescope on a small, utterly black patch of space right next to the Big Dipper constellation. So if you look up the Big Dipper and look at that constellation, apparently there was this one spot that was just totally black. And and what they did was they trained the Hubble's telescope lenses on that one black spot for 10 days and just left it open and just recorded what, what they could gather from that one spot. Well, after they looked at all the film, they realized that there were 10 thousand more galaxies that they weren't even aware of until that moment of that discovery. 10,000 that was filled with billions upon billions of stars. You know, uh, apparently in 2004, the scientists then did it again. And this time they focused on a patch of darkness next to the constellation of Orion. Of Orion. And they left the lens open for 11 days and they discovered now 10,000 more galaxies on top of the 3,000 galaxies. And Again, they were absolutely overwhelmed with the absolute vastness of the galaxy. At present, they're saying that there's 100 billion galaxies that they're aware of. 100 billion. And in the beginning, God created. God spoke, and the wonders of creation came forth. You know, I'm sure when God spoke, there was a big bang, but this big bang was not some cosmic accident. God is above it all. The Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit did what Randy Frazee, one of the authors of the story, calls the mother of all science projects. Creation was the result. I mean, did you hear what the worship team led us through in singing? God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. You are holy. The universe declares your majesty, and you are holy. 
Lord of heaven and earth. I mean, that's what made the psalmist break out in Psalm 8 uh, and write these words. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic your name fills the earth. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. And you gave them charge over everything you made. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name that fills the earth. You know, what the psalmist says gives us actually a real hint at the point of creation. Because I think we get ourselves in trouble if we think our significance is worth is based on size. Because if you were to compare what we are in comparison to the billions upon billions of galaxies, we are next to nothing. We are an atom of existence. And yet, when we read the story of creation, as we start here at the very beginning, we actually get to the real point behind the Genesis account. And you follow along in your outline, this is really our first point. It's where in creation we hear God saying this, I want to be with you. God says, I want to be with you. Now, in, I want to read from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and, and it's there on your outline, but let's read along and we'll see this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the crea- creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You know, I want to highlight something, actually, from one of Randy Frazee's books. Um, He writes this about this creative moment. He says, the God of the universe has created a place to come down and be with a community of people. He no longer wanted only to enjoy the perfect community he had as the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wanted to share it with us. The ultimate author of this grand story was not content to be all by himself anymore. The perfect and beautiful world God created was incomplete without his crowning achievement. People he could enjoy and love and with whom he could communicate. I mean, to put it another way, when we think about the very beginning, about why we exist, why we are here on this earth, God made us to love us. God made us for us to love him back. And God created a community of people so that together we could express love to one another as well. That was the plan. I mean, creation tells me that if I choose to live life with God, I will find purpose. But creation also warns me, as I look at this creation story, that if I choose to live life without God, it will have no meaning. Creation tells me that not only does God exist, but that I'm created and designed to know him. I love what the early church father Augustine said one time about this. He says, to fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek him is the greatest adventure. And to find him is the greatest human achievement. I mean, without putting God into the equation of reality and life, we remove the reason and the foundation for it. You know what creation also tells me, though? And I want to go back to this passage here that we read here in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. It tells us, so God created mankind in his own image, verse 27, in the image of God, he created them. Creation tells me who I am. You know, we live in a culture that says who you are is based on how well you perform and who you know and what people think of you. And so if you're a winner, then that's great. But, but, but heaven forbid the day comes when you're no longer a winner. Or too bad that you're not at the top of your class. Too bad you're at the bottom. Or too bad that you've gone through failures because you're not worth anything. 
or there's even cultures that, that say based on your gender, you're not as valuable as the other gender. I came from India in our visit this summer to India with World Vision. And they told us an interesting statistic, a very sad one. They said that 43 million girls wish they were boys because they know the, how they're going to be treated for their entire lives in the nation of India. You see, we live in a world that so often we forget who we really are. And yet the creation story tells me this very clearly, that I am made in the very image of God. And you are made in the very image of God. And guess what? The person who really even irritates you at work is made in the very image of God. That neighbor that drives you crazy because he mows too early on Saturday morning is made in the image of God. That person that is in your family that you go, God, why did you bring that person into our family is made in the image of God. Everyone that you see is made in the image of God. And therefore, we need to treat everybody with incredible respect and care and kindness. You know, as I think about this creation story, we also, though, see now at the very beginning of the story, we see how it all begins. God speaks and God creates and God creates us. And he's saying to us, I want to be with you. But then we see this shift. We see where where God gave Adam and Eve a perfect home in the garden. And actually, we have a, if you have your book, you, you, I, I think there's a map right at the very front. I, I just want to bring up that map for a second. And um, actually, Bible scholars think the Garden of Eden was actually created somewhere in the modern-day Iraq on the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Around there, you can see it's between Babylon and Ur. And, 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 and that's where this beautiful garden was. And yet, in this beautiful garden, God gave Adam and Eve something powerful because this is what it meant to be made in the image of God. No long, they were not going to be ruled by instinct only. In fact, they were going to be instead ruled by something called freedom of choice. Rather than force them into a relationship with him, God gave them the freedom to choose whether they wanted to be with him or go it alone. And so to provide a way for them to accept or reject this divine vision where God says, listen, I created you, I want to be with you, I made you so I could love you and you could love me. God says, I got I to gotta know, because love means a choice. I got to know what choice you want to make here. So he set two trees in the middle of the garden. One was the tree of life, which bore fruit that when eaten would sustain life forever. And the other tree was the knowledge of good and evil. And, and here we see the next shift, the movement of the beginning from creation to what we call the fall. And the fall is where God has said to us in creation, I want to be with you. And the fall is ultimately saying where we say, I don't believe you. Let, let's just pick up a part of the story here where, where, where we catch this. In, in Genesis chapter 3, we see the serpent, and Satan himself was coming in the form of a serpent. And it says here, it was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? I, I just want to pause just for a second on that question. I'm so convinced that when we try to live out our Christian faith, that's, that type of question hits us all the time, almost every day. Did, did God really say that? Does God really want us to do that? Does God really want us to give seven, forgive 70 times 7? Does God really want me to love all my neighbors? I mean, all of them? There's that question where you say, all of a sudden, we start to doubt God's way. And of course, the woman responds and saying, of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. And if you do, you will die. 
I mean, at this point, God had already introduced the idea of evil and death and disobedience in the sense of saying, if you make this choice, this is a choice that you're walking away from me. But of course, the serpent lies to her and simply says, you won't die. I think of what Paul writes in, in, in the book of Romans in the New Testament. He says, you know, people exchange the truth of God for a lie. And we still live in a world today where so many people say, I'm not buying this thing about God and his way. And they exchange the truth of God for the lies. Live for yourself. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die and there's nothing else. From nothing we came to nothing we go to. And on and on the list goes. Because listen, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. But it wasn't just Eve that was convinced. Adam was convinced as well. And they made the choice, and they were making the choice to simply really ultimately said this, God, we don't believe you. God says, I want to be with you, and this is how we can be together in a loving relationship, in paradise, in Eden, a place of delight. And ultimately, sin is when we say, God, I don't believe you. I'm going to go my own way. And sin entered the world, we're told. Let me quote Randy Frazee one more time. He writes this, Evil was deposited along truth in the DNA of Adam and Eve and in the DNA of every human being who came after them. And at the core of this evil, which is called sin throughout the Bible, is selfishness. You see, good looks out for others. Evil looks out for self. Selfishness is the root of hatred and jealousy and violence and anger and lust and greed. Adam and Eve are covered in it. And from that time on, the grand vision of God to dwell with us sat in ruins. I mean, I know for some of us, we wrestle with this part of the story because we say, but it was such a small act of disobedience. I mean, they just took some fruit and ate of it. And because of that, the whole world is in ruins because of it? I don't know about you, but as a parent, I always used to, you know, watch our children do these small acts of disobedience. And they try to blow it off. Well, it's not a big deal. But a discerning parent would know, no, at the root of that is rebelliousness. At the root of that, it's saying, not your way, my way. I want to go my way. I don't really trust you. I trust myself. See, I don't think it's the size of the act that matters. But I think where God always goes to is the heart, not the outward behavior. I mean, man looks on the outward appearance, we read later on in scriptures, but God looks on the heart. And I think God saw in the heart of Adam and Eve the birth of evil, the birth of sin. And he knew that no longer could they stay in this Garden of Eden where perfect, holy, innocent fellowship was meant to be experienced because evil had entered them. And isn't it interesting that the Garden of Eden, which was supposed to be a place of delight and intimacy and joy for just a short brief period, because the once the moment they sinned and disobeyed God, they hid in the Garden of Eden. Again, what happens when we sin? There's shame. There's hiding. There's blaming. There's loss. So we come to the final point of this first part of the grand story, the very beginning. There's the creation where God's saying, I want to be with you. The fall where we say, I don't believe you. But we come to this place now where we have to understand that now God has the grand dilemma. And the grand dilemma is simply this. It's our dignity versus our depravity. And you're saying our dignity versus our depravity. What depra what's depravity? Well, this is a big theological word for tonight. And for, as you watch this, and for those tomorrow. Our dignity goes back to the Genesis 1, 27. God created us in his image. Male and female, he created them. We are made in the image of God. God says, these are, these are the people I've created. 
And yet at the same time, he sees where evil takes us. And that's where the word depraved, the understanding of depravity comes from, where we are so depraved in our brokenness. Now, we live in a culture that really says you can be all that you can be and that all of us start off as a clean slate. We're all white little cherubs, all innocent. And somehow we just got to keep ourselves as white and pure as possible. And we can scrub ourselves up. But the Bible says no. Sin has entered your very DNA. Selfishness. Self-centeredness. You know, one theologian says the very core of our sin is that we judge others. I got an interesting habit or practice for you to try. I actually tried it just the other day. Go to a public place and just sit for an hour and watch people go by and only think positive thoughts about them. I mean, I'm talking about everybody you see. I'm talking about everybody you see. Every person that walks by. Just think loving kind, positive thoughts about them. I didn't last two minutes. I mean, I started saying, why are, they, why are they walking like that? Why is she talking like that? Why is he acting like that? Oh, I bet you he thinks he's a million. I started to judge. And you see, you know what? You know what? That's our depravity. Because instead of letting God be the judge, we put ourselves at the center of being the judge. You know, we live in a world now where there's still delight and great desires and deeds of worth. And yet we're also in a world with disease and disappointment, destruction and death. And the early stories that we read here in these early chapters of Genesis show us this tension between our dignity versus our depravity. I mean, we read on about, the, about Adam and Eve's two sons, Abel and Cain. And Abel comes and he delights God in his worship and what he offers him. And Cain doesn't obey and Cain gets jealous. And what does Cain become? He becomes a murderer. Our dignity and our depravity all right there. And then we move on and we see the story of the flood and, and there we see the f- world filled with terrible corruption and violence and death and disease and God says, I'm going to wipe it out. There's, there's too much depravity. And yet, God shows Noah and his family favor, grace, because there's still someone who can see the image of God clearly in our dignity our depravity. I don't know about you, but don't you find the story of the flood difficult? Don't you find it difficult? I, I used to, you know, go into Bible bookstores and see all those cute little toys with all the cute little dr- double giraffes and rhinos and little lambs and you kind of, they're all Velcroed in, you kind of pull them out and stick them back in and with little Noah's Ark, you know, little Noah's Ark. Little Noah's Ark was floating on the judgment of God. And everybody else was destroyed. All of creation was wiped out at that moment. And that's a hard story, but what I want you to not lose sight of that again is that, it's that, it's that we see both the mercy of God and the judgment of God all right in that one story. Sin is serious. And yet the mercy of God is still found. You know, here's the question. Where do we go from here? Is there a way forward? One verse I just do want to highlight and make this a note on your outline or write it into your margins of your the story and your chapter is in Genesis 3.15 where God is, this is after the, 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 the disobedience was, occurred and God is speaking to Satan through the form of the serpent and he's speaking to Eve and he's speaking to Adam. But this is what he says to Satan in this moment. And there's just one little verse here that in a sense, it's like, it's like hope in the darkness. It's like a light in the midst of this terrible moment where what God had planned had been ruined and now what is going to be done to restore God's broken creation? And... And I love this. And I used to read it when I was younger. I go, like, I don't get that. But the more I read about it now, the more it hits me how powerful it is. God says few words, but by goodness, this sets the whole tone. Because he says to 
Satan in verse 15 of chapter 3. He says, And I will cause hostility, hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And all of those people that look back and they say, where was the hope for God to deal with our greatest dilemma? Well, it's right there. It's, a, it's just a first glimpse that someday Christ would come. That Christ would come. And we hear it later on in scriptures with that last verse. I just want to highlight it in Romans 5, five verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See, there's the, the he would dealt with the dilemma. He recognized our dignity. He wanted to save us. And yet he dealt with our depravity through Christ. You see, it's through Christ that we hear God say once again. It's through Christ we hear God say once again, I want to be with you. And it's through Christ that we can say, I believe you this time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, as we come tonight to worship you, and God, our Father, we worship you, and we just ask that this story starts to make sense to us. Lord, tonight, may we walk away knowing that you're simply saying to us, you want to be with us. That's why you created us. And Lord, for us to live our lives without you is to live our lives without any purpose or meaning. And yet, Lord, help us to see that because of sin entered the world, sin has entered us. And sin is far deeper than we could ever imagine or understand or, or believe or comprehend. And, oh, Lord, we, we think of the words of, of uh, Tim Keller where he said, the gospel is this, we're more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. And yet at the very same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dare hope. Lord, help us to come to grips with our dignity in you and yet our depravity and our need for Christ. And Lord, again, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the hope. And we thank you as we begin this story. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.